Amen. What's up, guys? Go ahead and take a seat. Welcome to Renovation Youth. My name is Matt. I'm the youth pastor here. Well, hey, raise your hand. Give me a little cheer if you're at the fall retreat last weekend. Yes, it was great. It was awesome. A little cold, a little cold. I think we could all say that, but I'm looking forward to next week. If we missed you, you weren't able to come or you just didn't sign up, it's going to be amazing next year. So we hope to see you there. And also, uh, we're going to be training for that dodgeball tournament, right? We're going to go back and get that trophy. I know we lost. I know there were some iffy calls, but so Luke did carry us very hard. He was incredibly good. Yes. But we're going to go back and win and we're going to get that trophy. And also, uh, Nate and his messages were awesome. So hopefully they imp- impacted you guys as much as it did me. Well, hey, uh, this week, as you can see, our graphic changed. We're starting a new series. So we just finished up our I Am Statement series where we were looking at the I Am Statements of Jesus through the Gospel of John. And now we're starting a four-week series that's going to carry us until Christmas where we're looking at true identity. And the reason is, is this is probably the largest obstacle for Gen Z, which P.S. is you guys. And I I feel like the the culture is pushing people farther and farther and farther down an identity that fails them instead of reasserting where we can actually find uh, find our true identity. I mean, if we look at the past five years with COVID and just the increase in social media, we've seen exponential rises in depression, anxiety. We've seen things pop up that cultures have never seen before, like gender dysphoria, And if you were to ask me, for example, to illustrate this, if you were to ask me, hey, Matt, what's your identity? What what do you put your identity in? I'd be like, well, I'm a a youth pastor. Um, I'm a husband. Uh, I love talking about Bitcoin, right? But these are all, like, I might say that, and I feel like instinctually when you ask someone, hey, like, what do you do? We we say what job we have. We say what our major is. We say what we might want to go to college for. But that's not really who I am. That's not really my identity. Because if I say, hey, I'm a youth pastor, or I'm a husband, but then next week, I, I, I fail at my job. I do something I shouldn't do, or I'm a bad husband. Then what my identity is rooted in is my, um, my effort. And so if I fail as a youth pastor, I fail as a husband, then I can start to have this self-talk and this view when I look at myself and say, oh, I'm a failure. That's just what I am because my identity is rooted in the wrong thing. So shout a couple things out. What, do you, what are common things that other students, your friends, maybe you, that are so common in our culture, things that we put our identity in. Just go ahead and shout them out. What are things we put our identity in? Sports, Sports. good one. What else? Social media. Social media. Good job, Adam. What did you say, comedy? I guess comedy. What else? One more. Relationships and video games. That was two more, I'll allow it. Um, yeah, so let's say that you are, um, your identity is wrapped up in school. Right, and you're focusing hard at uh, your studies, and you're, you have a bad semester, and your GPA falls from a 3.5 down to a 2.3. I don't know if it actually falls that much in a semester, but let's just say that happens. Right, and then at the same time, part of your identity is your family. You're, you're really stuck. Your, your identity is fixed on who you are as a part of your family unit. And maybe your parents really want you to do well in school. And if your identity is wrapped up in those two things, and then your GPA starts to slip and you're not doing as well, then the same thing, we can start to view it as a failure because we're putting our identities in things that don't last or things that are not sturdy. Maybe you think that um, your identity comes from outward appearance. If your outward appearance isn't the way that you wish it was, maybe your identity is shaken because you view yourself as ugly or not as valuable as the person sitting next to you. And unfortunately, instead of addressing this massive problem we have in our culture, our culture tells us, hey, whatever you think your identity is, even if it's let you down so far, you need to sprint down that road as far as you can. Don't care what other people think. Don't even care about what God thinks about it. If you go far enough down that trail of what your identity is, then you'll finally find the security and acceptance that you're looking for and you so deeply desire. But the downside of going down those roads is that when we don't know what our identity is and when they're shaky, they lead to more depression, more anxiety, and ultimately more people walking in rebellion to our creator. And so today we're going to page one. 
So if you want to grab your Bible really open to page one, we're starting all the way back in Genesis chapter one because we want a foundation that we can uh, make a claim on, make a stake for our identity. We need to root our identity in something like the word of God that will not change, something that will last, that we can stake our identity upon. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter one, starting in verse 26. Uh, Verse 26, then God said, let us... Make mankind in our image, in our likeness, that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Um, but, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so this is the first main point that we're going to kind of unpack here as we're looking through this idea of true identity. Where can we find our identity? And it's this. God is the creator, therefore he gives the value. And so let's kind of unpack where we find that here in verses 26 to 27. So at first glance, When we see here that God says that all of us were made in the image of God, when the writer is saying that, it's kind of tough to understand, right? Because when we think about God, we know that God is spirit. We know that God is infinite. And if I look at myself, I'm like, I'm I'm physical. I have a body. I'm not infinite. I'm not everywhere all at the same time, right? I'm body, not spirit. Like, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, to be made in the image of God is to be created in his likeness. That's the language that we see used here. Um, And to be made in his likeness, we love because God is love. We seek justice and desire justice because God is just. We desire to be in community with other people because God, who is Trinity, three persons in one being, is in community with himself, right? I mean, we can just look around and see this at play. Like if you were to go back maybe one to five years and turn on the news and just pick an event that happened, right? Something where injustice was done, somebody was hurt. It's an outrageous thing. Pick anything and you will find people, scores of people, groups of people yelling for justice. They've seen a wrong happen and they want that wrong to be made Right, They see something that trespasses against a person and they're crying out, we need justice done. And what that's an outpouring of is who we were made uh, in God's image, as made in God's image because we desire justice because God is just. That's just an example. We're relational. We know right and wrong. We have spirit. We all have a spiritual part of us. We desire community and we will exist forever in some capacity. We share that eternal part with God. Now, we talked a couple weeks ago about how the location of that depends whether we trusted in Christ for salvation or we haven't and we're still in our sins. And so I think this passage kind of outlines four really critical uh, elements of who we are, right? It outlines who people are when made in God's image. So we're going to kind of outline these four. We can throw the first one up on the screen uh, right now. And the first step is that we are created And you are not cosmic goo flying around the universe with no purpose, right? Unfortunately, our public schools teach you the theory of evolution. And with the theory of evolution, we are just, we have just evolved from primordial dust, stardust flying around the universe. We're a jumbled uh, concoction of emotions and instincts. And so we should just do what we want. But the thing that people don't think about and don't talk about is in this creation account, right? Chapter one of Genesis is kind of a wide angle view of what happened uh, at at creation. Chapter two is when uh, the writer zooms in on the creation of mankind. And what we see is that mankind, us, male and female, we have been created as the chief part, the, the ultimate, the highest part of God's creation. And so when someone suggests that you came from an ape, or you came from a species like an ape, or a gorilla, or from dirt, or whatever, it's an insult to God himself, because it degrades his prized creation, which is you guys. That's number one. Number two, you were created by a loving God. And because you were created by him, he attributes to you value. Not because of anything you've done, but because of who created you and who owns you. You have value because you were created by and created for 
God. So let's picture this a little bit. Let's think that for whatever reason, all of you individually are walking down a back alley at night, right? It's relatively safe, right? You're fine, but you're, you're, you have to cut through here to go where you're going, and you're in this dark alley, and there's some trash cans off to your, to your left, and so as you're kind of walking by, being careful, you, you glance in the trash cans. And while you're looking in the trash can, there's, you know, the normal things you would expect in a trash can. There's trash, right? But at the bottom, you see this little glimmer, this little silver thing shining back at you. And you're like, yeah, maybe I should just, yeah, I'm just going to check out and see what that is. Maybe it's worth a little something. And so when you reach into the trash can, you pull out this old, rusty, dirty watch. You kind of dust it off and look at it and be like, yeah, I can maybe sell this for $10, $15, $20 dollars if I'm lucky. So the next day, you, you, you grab the watch, and after school, you go to a watch specialist or a watchmaker, and you go, hey, like, I found this last night. I don't know much about watches. It, it looks pretty beaten up. Maybe you just need it for parts, and maybe you, I don't know, give me $10 for it or something. So you hand it to him, and the watch specialist takes it and kind of rubs his hands over it and, and runs it under water, realizes that the wrist uh, uh, band is broken, so he, he fixes it up a little bit, adds it together, and, and fixes that, and, and he, he, t- he removes the rust and the dirt, and he washes it, and then the front of it becomes clean. And, and it can't really tell time anymore, but he fixes that part, and he, he aligns the time again, and then he looks up at you, and he goes, hey, do you know how much this is worth? And you're like, oh, man, maybe I, maybe I highballed it. Yeah, maybe like $5. I would take, I would take 250 right? And he goes, no, this is a, this is a vintage old Rolex worth over $20,000. Now, let me ask you a question from this thought exercise. Did the Rolex lose value because of where it had been? No. Did the Rolex lose value because it could no longer tell the right time? No. That could easily be fixed. Did the Rolex lose value because it wasn't as shiny as the other Rolexes? And the answer is no. You see, the value of the Rolex came from the name upon the watch, Rolex. It got its value from who created the watch. And the same is attributed to us as God's chief creation. We don't have value because of what we've done or where we've come from. We don't lose value because of those things, but we have value because the creator of the universe, God himself, has put his name upon you because he's created you in his image. Each and every one of you have value, regardless of whether you feel like you have value, because God says so. The third thing that we see here in Genesis chapter 1 is that we were created male and female. Unfortunately, this is a touchy subject in today's culture. The culture is constantly changing. It's constantly trying to figure out, oh, what are people's identities? What do people like, feel like? And, and the, the culture is just like a tornado, like running around an empty field. It's not rooted to anything. It's grasping on to air, but recently it's saying that, oh, like a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, and it's completely contrary to the word of God. But I don't want to like easily dismiss, like, hey, like guys, male, female, obviously, I'm sure many people in this room would probably agree with that idea, but I do think that there could be people here tonight that potentially struggle with that. And so I do quickly want to talk to those of you who do. First, If you're confused about who you are, maybe you don't feel comfortable in your own skin, you're not really sure if you're the right gender, whatever, I just want to encourage you and say that you are not alone. Second, I know it can be hard and confusing, especially in the middle school and high school years when there's so many things happening. And so I just want to tell you that if you're feeling confused, your your emotions are valid. But I would lovingly challenge you to trust God in the area of sexuality and the area of gender that you would submit to him and his design because he created you and he knows each and, one of, in each and every one of you the very best. And so also maybe walk with someone. Tell your small group leader, and this could be any area too of identity, tell your small group leader and allow them to walk you through what's going on in your life as God slowly and graciously reveals his plan. This last one is also relatively controversial. Number four, we are greater than animals. Verses 26 and 28 are pretty clear here that uh, humans, all of us, we have a different standing from the animal kingdom. And again, if we were to look at things, we'd be like, yes, duh, clearly humans and animals are, or humans and animals are, are very different. And if we were to look at the next chapter, where in chapter two, where creation zooms into the creation of Adam, we see that there are two things that um, separates Adam 
from the rest of creation. The first one is that animals were not created in God's image. They weren't. It says that humans were the ones created in God's image. And the second is we see that after God created Adam out of dust, out of dirt, that he breathed spiritual life into his nostrils. We don't see God do that with any other animals. And so uh, we were created in the image of God, and we have, a, we have spiritual life to some extent because, or we have a spirit because of what God breathed into Adam. And our culture has this so twisted. Again, the theory of evolution teaches that you guys evolved from apes, that you're nothing more than your ancestors that picked apples off the ground, that they were just balls of instincts doing whatever you needed to do and running around with your pack, but that's clearly contrary to what God says. And so I, I have a video here quickly if we want to get that ready. Okay, so this is a video that came out like six, seven uh, years ago. And what, he, what he's about to do is he's about to ask people on the beach, hey, if, there, if you had a, your puppy and a random stranger drowning in a river, which one would you save? Now, rand, okay, great, great answer. But what we see is that all these people are going to say their dog, which is so, co- and I'm about to get a puppy, and so I understand that, but all right, let's just go ahead and press play, and then we'll see what's uh, going on here at the beach. Hey, this is Mike Slater here in San Diego. I'm with my buddy's dog, Chase. Say hi, Chase. Yeah, oh, good job, Chase. So in light of Cecil the Lion and last week, and just absolute outrage over what happened to him compared to, well, what I think is not enough concern over the Planned Parenthood videos. We thought we'd come here to the beach and ask people what I think is a pretty simple question, but apparently, well, you'll see. So if a bus was hurtling down the street and it was going to hit either a foreign tourist or one of your dogs and you could only save one, which would you save? My dog. (laughs) <laughs> and you can only save one. Who do you save? I gotta save my dog, Butterball. My dog. I gotta save my dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> the dog. Either a foreign tourist or Molly. Who do you save? Molly. <laughs> what do you think the human would say? Well, they would be hit. What, what country? My dog. Obviously. French tourist. French tourist, yes, yeah, Damali. Even though it's a human, but my dog's part of the family. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly, but it also kind of reveals something really interesting. That people view, and I'm assuming they have a great emotional connection to their dog, right? And they don't want to see their dog injured. But people view an animal to the same level. They have them on the same playing field as someone who has the image of God in them. They, they were created in God's image. They have value because God says they have value, and we would just let them die to save this little creature that we pet and take for walks. It's kind of crazy. And I want to drill this idea down even farther. I think oftentimes when people look at how you value a human, they, they can say, oh, someone that's functional, someone that can choose, you know, has you know, options for their life or whatever. But I think God's word, the Bible is really clear here. Between, if you were to grab uh, an elderly person, let's say they're 99 years old, they, they can't see anymore, they can't hear anymore, they can't talk or think, they can't remember anything. They have no economic value for the country. They're basically a ball of flesh just sitting in a chair waiting to die. And then you, on the other end, you have a very uh, able lion. Let's just say a very able lion in its prime, it's just the best. Or maybe a dog that's a year old, super cute, and you love it. Which one has more value? And it's clearly the person, even though they are uh, disabled, even though they're basically waiting to die, that person has infinitely more value than that animal. Why? Because of two things. They were created in the image of God, and they have a spirit that was breathed into them by God. And so a person's value is not based on their function, what they look like, what they can do, or anything else. It's based on the creator who attributes value to that person. And the reason why I'm drilling this point so much is because I don't want you guys to ever question your value. And that, the, that your value does not come from what you've done. You don't lose value based on where you've been. It's not based on the family you come from or your achievements. Your value comes... All of your value comes from the God who created you. That's where your identity comes from. Each and every single one of you was created in the image of God. Okay, the second main point for tonight 
as we close out is this. Root your identity in Christ. It can be a little kind of complicated. I don't even think I explained it very well at the beginning. Like, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Currently on Sunday morning, uh, here on Big Church Sunday morning, uh, David and the other pastors are teaching through the book of Colossians. And in the first chapter of Colossians, we see this revealed about Jesus. Paul writes this about Jesus and says this, the son, who's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And so if you want to know what it looks like to fully live in your identity as a person, then look to Jesus who fully encapsulated it as the image of God. Root your identity, ground your identity in him. And maybe some of you are here tonight and you feel like a dirty Rolex. You've been places you know you shouldn't have gone. You've done things you know you shouldn't have done and you're not even close to being secure with who you are. And I want to tell you that God is looking at you with love and acceptance, seeing you with full value, not because of anything you've done, but because of who he has created you to to be and because he has chosen to give you value. And he doesn't need you to clean yourself up. He doesn't need you to straighten your life out, but he wants to give you a new identity rooted in Christ. And so tonight, uh, I'll call the band back up right now. Um, If you need that new identity, you need that new relationship with Jesus for salvation and to be welcomed, welcomed into God's family, I encourage you to take that step where you turn from the path, the sinful path that you're walking down and you just change your mind. Like, I, I'm sick of going my own way. I need to go with the way of Jesus. I need to allow him to give me identity. I need him to establish my identity and I need to root my life in him. And Lord, I trust you with my faith for salvation. And so if you need to do that tonight, I I encourage you to do that during this last song, just where you're sitting, just where you're standing, to say, Lord, I turn from my own ways, confess your sins to him, and then commit your life to him, that you're gonna follow him. Say, Lord, I need you to set my identity. I need to ground my identity in you. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. So don't wait any longer and do it during this last song. So Lord, we just come before you as we pray, as we worship, and we ask that, You would allow us to see us, allow us to see ourselves the way that you see us, created in your image, created above all of creation, created a distinct male and female Lord. And I pray if there's any part of those things or even any other areas of our lives where we're we're tempted to find our identity, Lord, I ask that, that you would allow us to find our identity in you. And if we need to come before you and, and repent, if there's anybody here tonight that just that needs that new identity, Lord, would you allow them to see the way that you see them? And would you see themselves the way that you see them? And as they start their new life, their new spiritual life tonight with you. So God, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross in our place. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in a relationship with you forever. And so we're about to worship you because of all those amazing things, because of who you are. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.